So first off, I want to say welcome everyone to the uh, 2023 NECAN webinar series, which highlights monitoring priorities in the Northeast. This is our eighth webinar in this series, and today's theme is new tech, sensors, and methods. And with the assistance of both this series and the presenters of this series, the NECAN steering committee will be working on the development of a regional monitoring plan uh, for OA. And these webinars will serve as a resource for them as this plan begins to come together. Updates on this series are shared through our mailing list and on our website. So be sure to check out our website for the full schedule. At the conclusion of presentations today, the steering committee will ask questions. Uh, Grace has to take off a little early today. So the steering committee will be asking Grace questions directly after her presentation. And then uh, we'll have a bit of a larger discussion after after Luke's, but we'll put aside a good amount of time for that, Grace, to make sure the steering committee has a good amount of time to ask you everything that they might want. Uh, and then after that point, if we have extra time, we'll open it up for more general Q&A from the rest of the audience. Uh, please feel free to uh, use the raise hand function at that time, or you can submit questions and comments in the chat, which we will be monitoring. Our first presentation is from Grace Saba. Grace is an associate professor who leads an independent laboratory and research group at Rutgers University, University uh, and in the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences and serves as a faculty in Rutgers University Center for Ocean Observing Leadership. Grace utilizes laboratory experiments, field research, and ocean obser observation to in investigate how seawater conditions, including environmental stress stressors such as warming, temperature, and ocean acidification, affect the ecology, physiology, distribution, and phenology of coastal marine zooplankton and fishes. Her work spans from local shelf waters of the Mid-Atlantic to remote regions surrounding Antarctica. Grace has co-founded the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Acidification Work, or MACAN, our neighbors to the south here at NECAN, uh, and serves on the MACAN Steering Committee and the Science Working Group, and has been working with the state of New Jersey towards developing a statewide OA monitoring network, and more broadly on their OA action plan. Uh, at this time, uh, please share your screen, Grace, and take it away. I will unmute myself too. <laughs> okay. Can you see that? Is that good? Looks great. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. I'm going to minimize it there. Okay. Okay, I won't, I can't see you now, Austin. So if um, you need to stop me, just tell me. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a verbal warning. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, it's exciting to hear um, all the state and regional efforts for ocean acidification uh, to address ocean acidification. Um, so happy to be here, happy to answer questions after. Um, I, because of the topic of the webinar, I'm focusing on some of our glider-based efforts that we've been doing since about 2018. Um, the project was initially funded by the NSF OTEC program where uh, Rutgers and um, University of Delaware with Weijun Size Group worked with Seabird Scientific um, to integrate their ISFET-based deep sea pH sensor into the gliders. Um, so that was the initial project. And, and then we were funded by NOAA Ocean Certification Program to kind of um, expand that out regionally and see, um, uh, I guess, with respect to how we can apply the sensors um, to towards a, a monitoring program. So that's what I'm gonna, present today. Um, this might be repetitive for some of you who have seen parts of this uh, presentation before, but hopefully it'll be a good um, reminder, at least for, for those of you that have seen parts of this. Um, so I'm preaching to the choir here, but the variability of these coastal systems becomes really important in terms of how we sample and how we can get the resolution of, of those measurements. 
um, in these highly variable systems. So we have all of these different processes that are impacting um, carbonate chemistry in the system. And so how do we, how do we measure that? Um, I've been using, I've, my work is focused primarily in coastal shelf systems um, and because the gliders can't really go up in rivers yet, um, but maybe we'll get there. Um, so the traditional monitoring platforms that we've been using in these coastal shelf systems, but also in our freshwater and estuarine systems are these moorings that, you know, we have pretty established pH and PCO2 sensors integrated into these buoys now. Um, we also have the vessel-based sampling where we can actually get discrete samples at different depths. And so that's giving us some level of, of depth resolution. Um, and also spatial resolution from ships. The buoys um, are good for uh, temporal resolution. We're getting a lot of uh, data over time and some depth if you can moor the sensors at depth, um, but we don't get changes between surface and depth. So we do know that you know most of the gaps can be addressed through advancements in the sensor technology. And that's what I've been working towards over the last five or so years. Um, We've been trying to integrate the pH sensor into gliders, and we've had those projects that I mentioned previously to, to do that and to see how well it works. So the ship-based monitoring, um, like I just mentioned, we can get the spatial resolution. So this is over time, um, and we can get some sort of depth resolution in terms of the measurements. Um, gliders um, are advantageous because um, they're a platform that can fly from the surface to bottom. And so you're getting that depth resolution. They fly in a seesaw pattern. The wings on the glider give it uh, forward a propulsion. So they can actually go about 20 kilometers per day in space. And they're sampling about every two seconds. So you're getting really high resolution data. Um, with depth and over space. Um, we can fly them, depending on what battery type we use, we can fly missions from about three weeks to um, 90 days, depending on kind of the battery that we're using in coastal systems. So we're getting this high resolution sampling. Um, they can be sustained operations. So we can typically get a glider back. We can clean it up, swap out batteries, um, you know, if, swap out sensors even if we need to. Um, and then put it back in. They're, they're pretty robust. Um, so you can get sustained operations. Uh, they can operate in hazardous conditions and um, just be out there when ships can't be, if it's too costly or if the conditions are too hazardous. And, you know, I'm in New Jersey where there's a lot of offshore wind development. So we're using gliders now as uh, baseline platforms to, to do those kind of baseline measurements. And we're realizing the there's more ad advantage to these. We might be able to navigate between the wind farms where um, larger oceanographic vessels may not be able to get in between. So that's an issue that we're, we're discussing in, in New Jersey right now also. So we know there's a lot of advantages to that platform. So what we did was we integrated, we modified and integrated the deep sea ISFET profile and pH sensor into the glider. So this is the, it's coupled with a CTD. You can kind of see how it's coupled in there. And then it goes right into the traditional CTD uh, uh, opening for the payload sensor bay. Um, and then we also, the other advantage for the gliders is that it can carry several different sensors. So we have an eco puck that's good for things like measuring chlorophyll, uh, backscatter, um, other optical properties. And then this one has a, an optode to measure dissolved oxygen. Um, so we're getting temperature, um, salinity, oxygen, and uh, optical um, information as, uh, along with our pH. It has a depth rating of about 1,000 meters. The pH is rated right now to about 1,000 meter depth. Um, so we integrated that in. Um, and then what we wanted to do is obviously test it in the field. So we've been pretty much doing that since then. We've had about 22 missions since 2018. Uh, you can see the missions um, in the colors here. You can see the glider transects and the areas we've covered. Um, we had the project uh, funded by NOAA Ocean Acidification Program that really um, expanded the sampling that we've been doing into 
the um, Gulf of Maine. So we now have a seasonal data set for the Gulf of Maine uh, based with the glider based data. Um, I've mentioned the suite of sensors that we can put on there. Um, we also the sensor that we've been using and we've been uh, so when we put the glider out in the water, we take uh, water samples, discrete samples and to check for sensor field accuracy. And we've been getting about 0.001 to 0.042. Um, that's the range we've been getting, except for one deployment, which I'll talk about in a little bit. We had uh, biofouling issues. Um, we are we have been estimating total alkalinity based on uh, conservative salinity, total alkalinity relationships. I have asterisks there because you know there's been a lot more research lately uh, seeing that the those the total alkalinity to salinity relationships may not be as conservative as we thought they were. So we have to be really careful in terms of you know using the best um, relationship for the season for an event like coccolithophore blooms can cause those uh, relationships to be skewed, things like that. So uh, those are things we have to really take into account when we do those estimations so that we can resolve the carbonate system. And that includes calculating saturation state. Um, and then obviously we're using the gliders to investigate the spatiotemporal dynamics. Um, we're putting these out seasonally so we can at least get some seasonal resolution. So we do have, um, um, you know, my group in general. So I'm one faculty of part of Are You Cool, which is the Center for um, Ocean Observing Leadership, and we're very um, adamant about data management, data quality assurance, and quality control. So we 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 have pushed that to the pH <laughs> sensor as well. Um, so we have um, methods where you know there there is a little bit of a time lag response um, on the um, pH sensor. We face that with our oxygen sensor as well, especially um, during summer where we have a really strong stratification from the surface to the bottom. So when we get those gradients, it the sensor lags a little bit in its response time. So we have ways that we correct that using the the up and down yo to basically even them out. Um, but we've been able to now include the pH data with our delayed mode quality control data sets that are now being submitted to GliderDAC, ERDAP, and OCADS. Um, so we have uh, the met methodological approaches to, to do the data processing quality control and then the data submission. Um, so I wanna show you some data now. We've gotten through kind of the specifics on the sensor and the data. So. Um, these are, the, this is a seasonal uh, data set that we've collected in the Mid-Atlantic Bight. It was published by my graduate student um, at the time, Liza Wright Fairbanks, who's now at OAP. Um, so you can see the resolution. These are just cross-shelf transects coming uh, near shore off New Jersey, basically to the shelf break um, over different seasons. So you can see winter, it's very well mixed. We have um, pretty high aragonite saturation states for the area. Spring, we start seeing the thermal stratification set up. Um, we get some low salinity events from uh, precipitation coming in um, from the near shore. And we're starting to see lower aragonite saturation state in the bottom waters where it's starting to be uh, cut off. The ventilation is starting to be cut off. By summertime, you can really see that signal. This is the, the cold pool where there's a mass of cold water. It's about 10, eight to 10 degrees that is basically just a stagnant sits there and doesn't mix with the surface through the whole summer season. And the aragonite saturation is typically where we see it the lowest um, seasonally. And then in fall, we get storms that come in. Um, we have hurricanes, we have nor'easters that come in and start bringing that warm, salty uh, Gulf Stream influence slope water onto the shelf and it basically alleviates um, any kind of low uh, aragonite saturation state that we see in the summertime. Um, I did wanna point out that these, um, the cold pool is where we see really important habitat for these commercial species for the state of New Jersey. Um, so that's an area, a habitat of concern and one we wanna keep monitoring, particularly in the summertime. Um, we do now have, uh, sorry, I put this there so I wouldn't forget to say it. <laughs> a full set of seasonal glider-based missions for the Gulf of Maine now. So um, we're currently 
processing and QCing all of those data. So we'll have a nice seasonal data set pretty soon. Um, one of the other interesting things that we've seen with the data is kind of these event-based um, occurrences where we have, um, we haven't captured uh, an upwelling event yet off the coast of New Jersey. Um, off the coast of New Jersey, we do get them in the summertime, but they're very sporadic and they only last one or two weeks. And we haven't captured one yet in the pH glider data, but we have captured a few times now um, where we see these warm core rings that spin off and sometimes in, get in, uh, start uh, influencing the coastal shelf system. So they'll sit right on that slope um, area and the water starts getting intruded onto the shelf. And I wanted to just show a little bit of those data because it is really important that when these events occur and these can actually um, last quite a bit of time. So months, uh, weeks to months um, on the shelf and really impact oceanography. So this is looking at some cross shelf transects um, comparing 2019 where we did not have a warm core ring intrusion in the summertime versus 2021 where we did. And um, you can really see this is temperature. So this is the cold pool kind of isolated off with this white line. And you can really see it, um, the cold pool had a much uh, a wider horizontal extent over the shelf in the non-core uh, ring year. And then it was dramatically um, reduced in that horizontal extent and likely volume um, when we had that warm core ring influence. So you can see that warm water coming onto the shelf. Um, the bottom temperatures, so, you know, it's really cold um, traditionally when we don't have a warm core ring event in the summer, um, organisms like that. <laughs> um, and when this warm water uh, is injected, it's, you know, it, it reaches temperatures that are at maximum range for optimal growth of sea scallops. It's above range where sea scallops will actually spawn. Um, and it's above the range where yellowtail flounder occur. And these are really um, these are species that really um, depend on that on that cold pool seasonally. So that was a big dramatic change for those organisms. Uh, this is the aragonite saturation state now. So using um, pH and estimated total alkalinity as inputs along with temperature and salinity. And this is the difference. So again, 2019, um, yeah, we saw pretty low aragonite saturation states in the cold pool during that summer. And then the um, aragonite saturation state was greatly increased uh, when that warm core ring intruded onto the shelf. So that's actually good for, in terms of ocean acidification. Um, it was a pretty much alleviated on the outer shelf. Um, so, you know, there's this really cool interplay now that we're, that we would like to continue monitoring, particularly with co-located samples of organisms where, you know, they're being alleviated from that stress of uh, potential stress from ocean acidification, but then they're getting the temperature stress. So which one's worse for them? Um, and so kind of going into how we're applying these data now, um, we've been asked, uh, NOAA um, was asked by the Fisheries Management Councils for the Mid-Atlantic and the North New England to um, start incorporating some ocean acidification information into the NOAA State of the, State of the Ecosystem Annual Reports. Um, and so uh, I've been working with NOAA to do that now. So one of the, this is one from the 2022 um, annual report, and there's uh, We've used all the data possible that includes glider data and quality controlled vessel based data to map bottom pH. So this is bottom pH um, over this time period, 2007 to 2021. And so just to get a sense of what the summer conditions are like in bottom waters in general. And then we have the glider data that can show the transects from that summer. So that's this is the product that we put out. Um, for the Fisheries Management Councils in 2022. This year, what we were trying to do was um, figure out what sensitivity levels there are for organisms. So based on laboratory experiments where we defined a sensitivity level as um, a level of carbonate chemistry 
where uh, the organism started seeing negative impacts. And that could be to growth, to development, um, to reproduction, things like that, calcification. So um, we did a literature search and this was conducted primarily by Teresa Schwimmer, Balshan and Janet Nye at Stony Brook. Um, and they were um, looking at, uh, focused on uh, species that were um, commercially or recreational important in the mid-Atlantic region. And so what we wanted to do with this information was develop maps that were, you know, trying to see if and when and where have we seen any of these sensitivity values reached for the organisms. And so we have the, this is what we put out for this year. This is the, um, I'm showing the New England report because we selected a few organisms specific to the New England area of interest. Um, so on the left, again, we're using all of the available quality controlled data to look at this time bottom aragonite saturation state. Um, and you can see areas where we tend to see lower um, values. So pretty much the bottom of the Jordan and Wilkinson basins in the Gulf of Maine, um, and then uh, near shore off the coast of New Jersey, particularly in the Northern section near the Hudson Canyon. And then what we did was just plot where we saw sensitivity levels reached in the uh, observation data. So for Atlantic cod, anything with this bluish green color uh, is where we saw aragonite saturation states at that sensi sensitivity level or below. And same with American lobster. So they have a, a lower threshold or not threshold, but lower sensitivity level. So you saw less um, areas and times where, where they might be potentially vulnerable. Um, so that's the kind of information that we're putting out. Of course, we'd like to have more data that's paired with um, um, biological metrics to kind of get a better idea of how the organisms are actually responding in the system when they see um, conditions that get to those lab-based or lab-derived sensitivity levels. Um, I will talk about a few of the challenges. The first one that we faced was biofouling. Um, and that's something that we've tried to overcome and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but we had, we actually, we deployed a glider off of the ECOA cruise um, in 2018, it was July of 2018 and uh, ran it across George's bank and it was doing very wonderfully. And then we got stuck in a warm core ring <laughs> and we couldn't get out of it. The glider, um, it, you know, it's not propelled, it's a buoyancy driven system. so trying to get it, get it out of any strong currents is quite difficult. Um, but after five or six days, we were able to get it out. And then we noticed the pH data were looking a little wonky. So we met it, we took a boat out of Montauk, met it, the glider up and, and it was covered in biofouling. So we had, this is a picture of the actual ISFET sensing element and there's like clams, young clams on it. Um, and the pH offsets, which means the difference between the glider based or the glider measured pH versus like a discrete water sample um, were really high and just um, not acceptable. So um, that became an issue that we knew we had to address. So um, Seabird uses antifouling cartridges that are in line with the pH CTD sensors. So they added a second cartridge. There is a dark casing around the elements um, to help uh, reduce biofouling. The other thing, things were more operational. So we we're start we start we're starting to and we do it now still turn the CTD pump off. So the pH requires the pump because it needs the water to flow past the sensor. Um, but we've been turning it off when it's at the surface um, to just allow because um, uh, it's warmer at the surface. Um, but we also want to allow the antifouling to dissolve a little bit and kill any of the fouling that's on there when we when we are at the surface. Um, and then we do regular cleaning and recalibration by the manufacturer. So we don't ever deploy pH sensors more than two times um, in in our group to before we send it back for cleaning and recalibration. Um, even sometimes in the summer, if we have a summer deployment and we see some fouling, we will send it back just after one deployment. So it is a lot of turnover, um, but that's what we choose to do for higher quality data. 
Um, the other challenge, which is quite large, is that the sensor is not commercialized yet for gliders. Um, we've had um, a lot of discussions with Seabird. They they want to do it, but um, they just haven't been able to. They had a lot of orders that they had to fulfill for the Argos floats. Um, and then we had COVID hit and they were closed for a long time during COVID. And then there was the issue with the Honeywell ISFET pH chips that they Honeywell stopped making, but now it's getting back up to speed in terms of the development of them, but there's gonna be a huge uh, delay and backlog. So it's gonna be a while. I estimate about five years before, five more years now before Seabird kind of revisits that discussion for the commercialization for our gliders. So hopefully they still wanna do it. <laughs> Grace, we're getting a little close to time here. Just uh, okay. uh, two minute this warning. Is my, great, thank you, Austin. This is my last slide. Um, gliders are, you know, we're using them a lot. These, these red, I hope you, hope you can see them. These red transects are where we're flying gliders now. And this is just uh, from 2019. So four years later, we've got a lot more red in the images. We're flying gliders globally. Um, we're flying them uh, more frequently. So if we can, you know, develop those sensors and get them on to more gliders, and you can really kind of imagine how, you know, a glider-based carbonate chemistry program might develop uh, rapidly and expand. Um, and again, I'll reiterate, the good thing for gliders is that we can start thinking about multi-stressors because of all the different sensors we can put on them. We're getting that um, depth profiling, so we're covering that. And then hopefully we can get sensors to be, you know, minimized for things like total alkalinity and or PCO2. There are some efforts for PCO2, but there, there's been issues with the time response lags really, really long. Um, so, you know, if we can start, you know, keep advancing the technology and uh, we can do a lot more things. So that, that was it. So I'll, I'll stop talking now, but I just want to thank my glider and software team that are that are awesome and help me with the data and all the data management. So thank you so I'll much. Uh, Thanks. I, I'm gonna stop my screen share real quick so I can actually see people. If if I need to show a slide again, I can bring it back up. Of course. And I'm going to throw the floor over to Chris Hunt, which who will be facilitating oh. the QA session. Good. Hey, Hi, Grace. Chris. Hi. Thanks very much. You are, you are who I had in mind when I was talking about the total alkalinity salinity relationships. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine why. Um, <laughs> I think we'll be talking more about that on Friday. But um, I wanted to maybe pick your brain sort of big picture, right? Um, the, the mission of this group is to develop recommendations for a regional monitoring system. And obviously gliders could play a part in that, but what would you think, like if, if somebody handed you a blank check, what, what, would it, what would you see as a glider base or gliders as a constituent of a regional monitoring system? What would that look like, do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's part of it, right? It doesn't replace mm -hmm. everything that we need. So uh, gliders are good at getting some spatial resolution mm -hmm. um, and, you know, getting that subsurface resolution. So I, I would say at a minimum, having gliders do a seasonal based program to get mm -hmm. the seasonal kind of climatology and the depth, um, the depth resolution. Um, I, we've had this discussion a lot with the state and trying to figure out what a New Jersey state monitor, OA monitoring program would look like. And, um, you know, I think at a minimum gliders would be very advantageous for that seasonal based um, sampling, but then trying to, and, and then trying to maybe pinpoint locations where we might need to focus a little bit more temporally, right? So if yeah. we could, you know, that's kind of the, point of synthesizing the glider and the vessel-based data is to kind of start thinking of where those hot spots for OA might be seasonally and then put some moorings out so we can get more of the temporal resolution. Um, the other thing yeah. about gliders that they're missing is 
the very bottom, right? Yeah. And so if you have a sea scallop bed, you know, the gliders has an altimeter, so it detects the bottom and then it goes up. So you're missing like the top meter, meter and a half from the bottom. And so you could have some carbonate chemistry that's actually a lot different near these um, shellfish beds and the glider's not capturing that. So um, you would want some, some sort of bottom moored system. So I think that's how gliders could play a role is to do this, have the seasonal resolution over space, but also over depth, but then um, yep. help pinpoint where we kind of put other assets and platforms. You really, you really put your finger on a theme that's emerged over and over again through these webinars of near bottom, the, the paucity of near bottom carbonate chemistry data. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's really emerged as a sort of critical data gap and one that we have some, some people are working on, but like the technology is, uh, is going to be tricky to set up, I think. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's, that's a big one. That's a big question mark, especially because that's where a lot of these vulnerable species spend their time, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and did anybody else have a question they want to throw in, or I can keep, I can keep yammering too. Well, we have some, and then I think Dwight had his hand up for a while. No. Oh, please, Dwight, go ahead. My, my hand's always up. Um, yeah, Grace, I, I really, really love the work you're doing. I'm, I, you know, I speak about it a lot to other folks, and uh, how pleased I am that it looks like we're getting to the point where we can get a capability that can really do almost full water column. Um, right now, our observing system has been heavily biased to surface mm -hmm. because it was, it was, you know, basically a grandfathered in carbon flux observing systems that they then just redesignated as ocean acidification. <laughs> um, so, you know, my challenge is, uh, has been to try to figure out how we're going to cost effectively get that full depth coverage. Um, and I love the idea of using gliders to at least to try to pinpoint where you might want to put up time series. Um, so, all right, I got a lot of questions, but I'll only ask a couple. Um, one is sort of, uh, is my bean counter hat. There's a lot of capabilities that the gliders have that you've pointed out a lot, a whole suite of sensors, um, many of which are relevant to ocean acidification, but many are, are relevant to a whole range of communities, you know, people that are focused on hypoxia, um, you know, EPA standards for nutrient loading, a whole lot. So is there a, a, a network, is there a way in which we can be coordinating funding in such a way, you know, so you've got this big hat <laughs> and it's like, well, who, who's, who's, who's tracking and how do you, how do you make sure that, you know, one entity isn't carrying uh, the entire package when in fact, you may have multiple leveraged funding entities that could be coming into supporting a much more comprehensive network. And that would reduce the risk, you know, to the operation when you've got a diversity, a diver uh, you know, funding, diverse funding portfolio to the operation. So is there, is that set? Maybe that's what the IUS is supposed to be functioning as. Yeah, I was going to say that sounds like an IUS thing. Um, I mean, the IUS is good at re uh, coordinating regionally, right? So, and each region has their own priorities, but it's also national. So if IUS wanted to make, you know, putting pH sensors or other carbonate chemistry or other sensors on gliders, then they could, right? They would they would probably have a funding call through the RAs and regional associations and then address it that way. Um, yeah, it's, but it, I guess outside of NOAA, right? Um, like right now, you know, it's, it's locally gonna be, it's de locally dependent, right? On what the states care about. Um, so right now, New Jersey and New York, and, and then starting now, some of the Southern states are very, um, uh, obviously uh, um, focused on offshore wind, right? And so a lot of these offshore wind companies need at, at a minimum two years of baseline measurements. And so that's 
they're starting to fund this. So we have seasonal glider deployments with pH sensors funded by the state of New Jersey um, because they care about climate change and they care about getting the baseline information for the offshore wind um, application. So um, it's, it's gonna be hard to coordinate states, I think, um, because each state has different priorities, but I think, yeah, that's why I just think it's, I think that would, IUS would be a good uh, venue to kind of tackle that in, in a national way, at least, or I mean, even OAP, right? But through OAP through IUS. And, and can I just ask one quick follow-up on that? Um, mm -hmm. So what, what do you think we as a community can do to kind of move the needle on the transitioning of the sensor to commercialization? I mean, are we, are we relying too heavily on Seabird? I mean, are there other opportunities that we can pursue? Yeah, I've, I've talked a lot about this with Yui. I know at Takashita at Mbari, um, cause they worked with Seabird to integrate the ISFET into spray gliders, which is a, a type of glider, but it, it's a different type of glider. It does more um, offshore work. It's better for like deeper, um, deeper uh, water columns. Um, which is obviously what they have out of Mbari. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, they're running across the same issues. So I, I'm hoping that we'll have just other companies that will invest in making different pH sensors or, or P, improve the PS, PCO2 sensor. And then, you know, we have a flow through the Contrast total alkalinity sensor, but I don't, I don't know if that, I don't know if there's, I haven't heard of any attempts to try to, you know, miniaturize it for glider applications. I haven't heard of that yet. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure. I just, I hope that we can, you know, outside of Seabird, I hope that we can get some community behind that, that will, that will kind of drive that progression forward uh, with Seabird. You know they they sound like they're still interested it's just it's going to take a, an army to get them to like actually do it <laughs> so <laughs> and not just grace me. what is it what they've been doing is telling me if you hear of anybody that wants one please have them contact us i think they're trying to just see what the interest is right and then by the time that i think they heard from a lot of people they were ready to they were, they were thinking about doing it, but then everything happened with COVID and the Argos orders and then the, the ISFET chip. And then last I talked to them, they said, it's probably gonna be about five years, but we still wanna do it. <laughs> well, it seems like the, the big push on Marine CDR initiatives right now, which may have a fairly yeah. sizable price tag with it, might change yeah. the, cal the, you know, the calculus. Yeah, that's a good point. Grace, yeah, I meant we'll, to need, ask, uh... we'll need monitoring for those initiatives. Sorry, Chris, go ahead. What does it take to commercialize? Like, what does Seabird have to do that's different from the regular CFED? It's, I don't know all the ins and outs of it. I just okay. know from the business side of it, they need to know there's a demand for it. Okay. They want to make okay. sure they can probably make some money. But this is, um, it requires some hardware modification to go on the glider above what the standard CFED comes from. Um. Yes. Yeah, okay. but they have the design and everything sure. for it, right? So they, they know how to do it. Yeah. Um, so it's not like, it, and in terms of design, I don't think they need to do anything more. I think it's more of figuring out the cost benefits analysis or whatever that business term is. <laughs> you know, they want to make sure that it's not going to be a money sink for them. Yeah, to build them sure. and then and then to maintain them right yeah and th this yes. is this has been i think the challenge for bgc sensors writ large is that we're forever a boutique community and mm -hmm. any market hits market saturation pretty quickly i mean i have yeah. to map the o2 system so um we had to retransition that back into noaa <laughs> so i don't have a solution for that except for maybe cdr might be where the money's going to be yeah, I think just them hearing more from bigger entities than individuals would be really helpful too. You know, they're hearing from me, they're hearing from, you know, 
Neil Pettigrew, they're hearing from Charlie Flagg. You know, they're hearing from people that want the pH sensor, but individuals, not larger entities. If the Navy said they wanted them, then we'd be having a different conversation. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, Julia, can I ask a question? I, I think that we want, we, we don't want to have monopolized by Seabird either though. We try to sort of uh, expand the supplier of the sensors in the case something happened to Seabird, for example. And we have a hard time getting service from Seabird now. Response time is so slow from them. Mm -hmm. We try to sort of move forward sort of towards the RBR, for example. So okay. sensors, I hope there is a more sort of a suppliers for this. Yeah, RBR, I think, developed a pH sensor, but I don't think it's, uh, from what I've heard, and I don't know um, much in terms of specifics, that the response time is not great. Yeah, it's, uh, that, we, we don't use yeah. their sort of recommend, that's Italian made one actually. Yeah, okay. But, uh, there is other sensors, controls, and others, and yeah, if we can adapt that one, and I don't know how difficult it is. Yeah, I, and it. I think I don't need, I don't know, I don't know the answer to that either. But um, I know A and B is making a pH sensor that seems to be really good against like biofouling, and it can um, measure pH pretty accurately at high salinity ranges, but. It hasn't been tested for like depth profiling yet or anything like that, I don't think. So hopefully there'll just be more companies developing cheaper, but still high quality sensors. I know Kamiko put a question in the in the uh, document. I don't know if you wanted to ask it about a second carbonate oh. system parameter, if you just wanted to talk about that a little more. Because the salinity, alkalinity has a problem in coastal region, it makes sense to have two of them. But I'm not quite sure how difficult it is structure-wise to put two cabinet sensors in it. Has to change the entire glider sort of structure or what weight issue? And yeah, it's so the gliders can only have a certain amount of sensors, right? They have a certain amount of connectors, and the board can only support. I think it's up to four or five. You can have external sensors, but anything in that needs internal power or um, information transfer, um, it has a maximum of four. Um, so you can do it, but you would take away from something else. But in terms of carbonate chemistry, it is important to have two. Um, so who you know, if somebody's buying a glider for that purpose, they would want to, and then they would probably get rid of something, whether it's the optics or the uh, oxygen. Um, and then the issue right now, though, is that the PCO2 sensor, which I think is farthest along in terms of other um, carbonate chemistry sensors for gliders, um, the response time is really long, um, like sometimes a minute or more. And, you know, you just can't, in a shallow coastal system, it might be okay, like in a deeper, uh, you know, a deeper shelf or wherever, if you're flying open ocean, it might be okay. And as, particularly if the stratification is not very big, um, but for shallow coastal systems with strong seasonality, that's going to be a big problem. So it's probably fine in certain areas, but not others. But I, I know that there, you know, there is a lot of effort to continually improve that sensor. So hopefully it'll get there. Um, pretty soon with some more effort and time. But that would be great to have pH and PCO2 um, integrated into a glider. I was hoping after TA and pH. <laughs> yeah, even better. But as far as I know, that one's farthest out. I haven't, like I said, I, I haven't heard of any efforts to do any kind of glider applications with that one yet, unless someone else has heard. I know Chris, I know you're really familiar with the vessel based flow through. I don't know if you've heard anything about efforts to put on. I haven't heard platforms. anything about efforts to take the contra sensor and package it for underwater deployments. I know that there's prototype 
um, SAMI TA sensors mm -hmm. that are being tested okay. right now. Um, I know there's a project to try to do TA measurements using a CFET and do, uh, it, it, it's complicated and I'm not sure um, if it's had much success yet. So there are efforts to develop, you know, submersible TA sensors you could deploy on a platform like a glider, but to the best of my knowledge, none of them are really ready for prime time yet yeah. or even in, even in the near future that I've seen. Yeah. Um, I would love to continue this discussion and keep uh, peppering Grace with questions because she's doing such cool stuff, but we also want to make sure that Luke has enough time to present and do questions as well. Um, so I'd like to really thank Grace for taking the time to, to chat with us today. It's been really great. And Grace, I'm going to just put thank my you. question in the chat if you wouldn't mind grab my checking it out. Oh, Thanks. sure. I'll do that before I have to run. And thank you so much. Yeah, I have, I unfortunately have to run. So Luke, I'm sorry I'm missing your presentation. Um, no worries. But thank, thank you again for thank having you. me. And anybody, feel free to email me um, with any additional questions. Yeah, just echoing everyone else. Thanks again, Grace. Uh, and next up, we're going to hear from Luke Thompson. Luke is an associate research professor at Mississippi State University based at NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory in Miami, Florida. Luke received his bachelor's degree at Stanford University and his PhD at MIT, both in, bio both in biology. His current research focuses on marine systems from microbes to fish to mammals. Using omics method, especially DNA sequencing, his lab is developing methods to facilitate high throughput environmental DNA sample processing and data analysis and applying them to monitoring and conservation efforts in the Atlantic Ocean, Gulf of Mexico, and the Great Lakes. Uh, please, uh, everyone, welcome Luke. And Luke, you could share your slides. Okay, will do. Okay, can you see, is that full screen? I'm seeing a full black screen and I saw the minimized slides before. You might have to click one forward. Now we can see everything. Yeah, but you don't see it in full screen mode. Um, it's pretty close though, Luke. It's yeah. pretty close. Let's just go with this. Um, so thank you for the invitation. Um, as Austin said, I'm Luke Thompson, and I'm based at AOML, uh, Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory in Miami. And um, my position is through Mississippi State and the Northern Gulf Institute. So just to give you a, a brief introduction to environmental DNA. Um, so I like this this example, um, if you're a dog owner or you've, you've been around animals, of course, you know, they leave behind traces um, everywhere they go. Um, and including in that, you know, hair that you can see is, is lots of DNA that you, you can't see. Um, and so that's a, a nice way to think about environmental DNA um, is that it includes, you know, the, the traces, the genetic traces of, of organisms that are, um, are left behind um, after that organism is gone. So on your, your car seat, if you have a dog, it's probably covered with hair like this. Um, so in the ocean, there's lots of examples. Uh, you know, there are, of course, um, billions of different kinds of organisms and they all are leaving traces in the environment. And so that includes everything from um, mammals and fish, um, smaller vertebrates to invertebrates and, and all the way down to microbes and viruses. And so um, we can detect these, these organisms by the DNA traces they leave behind. And so on the right um, is just showing that there are different environmental factors that can play a role in um, whether you detect DNA or not, such as um, degradation by enzymes or, or temperature or oxygen or, or uh, UV or time um, that we need to be mindful of. So um, 
thinking about some of the methods that we use or techniques. Um, so on the on the left is a, a, a hypothetical drop of water that may have some um, tissues or waste material from, from different organisms, um, may have intact cells like bacteria or protists or decaying cells or even free DNA or RNA. We can uh, extract the DNA from those organisms. So we try to break up the cells into um, molecules and we can extract the DNA molecules using their physical properties and, and, and variety of chemicals. And then once we have that, um, that DNA extracted, we can perform different um, methods on those. So um, we can do uh, quantitative PCR, um, which is how the some of the COVID tests work, right? They, they amplify the, the DNA or RNA in the case of, a, of an RNA virus, but it, usually we're, we're thinking about DNA here um, to look at, you know, quanti quantitating very carefully how many of a, a single species is present. But you can also do meta barcoding where you sequence the a gene from um, the same gene from a lot of different organisms, or you can do shotgun metagenomics where you sequence all the DNA or as much as you can from an environment. Um, and the great thing about um, eDNA and, and omics methods is we can capture diversity from microbes to vertebrates or um, microbes to mammals, as we sometimes say. So a little bit more about the process. Um, we, we collect a sample and I'll talk about a few different ways we collect samples. We filter the material onto a, um, a, a membrane um, using different kinds of filters, but generally that's the way we get the DNA is by filtering. Um, so things that are very small may pass through, but uh, most of that DNA is gonna be in some kind of, um, attached to a cell or in a cell in many cases and will be captured on a filter. Um, we extract the DNA uh, using the methods I was, I was just talking about. Um, we do some kind of preparation of the, of the DNA. We sequence it using one of several different technologies and then, and then do data analysis to, to get a sense of, say, for example, the relative abundance of different species. So uh, one of the sampling technologies that we're, we're working with is called the um, subsurface automated sampler for eDNA or SASE. Um, shown on the left are five of them. They're, um, they're out of the lab. They're normally submerged in the water, but here you can see them more clearly um, during a test that we did. And, and so um, when they're all in the field, the, those little filters, that, that are, those white filters that you see would be inside that little black backpack and, they, and the, the whole thing would be submerged underwater. Um, so this is a, effectively, it's a peristaltic pump um, or two pumps, one to pump water through the filter and a second one to pump preservative through the filter after uh, the water is filtered. Um, we, can, we can filter, you know, a couple liters of water through a filter and then, um, and then it's, the preservative goes through and we can retrieve that sampler, you know, maybe uh, later that day or the following day and, um, uh, Grace was talking about biofouling, so that's something we're, we're interested in, in understanding. Um, but if we leave it out for just a, a few days, we're, we're in good shape with that. Um, so one of the places we're deploying that is at the Coral City Camera site. Um, and uh, this is a really cool project um, where they have a live webcam. Um, I, I won't show um, the feed here, but you can definitely check it out. Um, to see to see the feed, and so we're we're comparing those that video feed to the eDNA we get there, and then we're also looking at um, a reef restoration project called Mission Iconic Reefs that NOAA is is a big part of, and um, and so we're monitoring restoration. So um, this next slide shows you that. So we can imagine um, a a restored reef versus a you know status quo sort of degraded reef, and over time. Um, as the reef is restored and, and corals are outplanted um, and things start to, to grow and, and fish come back, um, you know, maybe there's even more human use coming back. As we monitor that using DNA and other methods, we, we hope to see, um, you know, hope to be able to detect those changes in the, in the fish community and the coral community and the microbial community over time.
And so that SASE device that I showed is, is going to be a big part of that sampling effort. Um, a little closer to home, we were doing some testing and, and just uh, kind of a fun story. We, we measured um, eDNA from the Rasmus doc. So AOML is here um, in Miami. Um, you can see um, Miami Beach in the background and Fisher Island. So uh, we, we took some samples from Rasmus Doc and we noticed, you know, we saw lots of typical South Florida tropical species, but then we also saw some strange things like rainbow trout, Atlantic herring and um, uh, smelts. And so long story short, we, we were able to figure out that the Miami Sea Aquarium shown here on the bottom was, was dumping fish guts every night um, that they've been feeding the marine mammals. And we were detecting that in our, the eDNA data. So, um, what was originally kind of a worrisome result turned out to be a cool kind of um, proof of concept that we could detect something that we weren't expecting um, that was that and we, we could tie it back to the source. Um, so it's, a, it's definitely a powerful technology. So another um, method or way of collecting samples is using um, autonomous underwater crew, underwater vehicles. So this is um, similar kind of design to the gliders that that Grace was talking about, although this one is, is um, powered. It's a, a Tethys uh, long range AUV and, it, and uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute or MBARI has outfitted these with a, what's called a third generation environmental sample processor or 3G ESP. Um, and then that will has all these cartridges and, and, and each cartridge contains stacked filters of 0.2 micron and five micron filters that will collect um, DNA containing um, microbes and other, other organisms in, in the environment. So this was, um, has been deployed in various settings. I'll, I'll just show a brief example from, um, from Lake Erie. And um, so using this, the glider during a harmful algal bloom in uh, the summer of, I believe was 2019, uh, and 2018, yes. So um, there it turned out there was a much stronger bloom in 2019 than 2018, and um, the data bears that out. So what we're looking at here is um, gene copies per milliliter of a of a toxin, um, basically one of the genes that's required to produce um, the um, microcystin um, toxin produced by microcystis cyanobacteria. Um, and that is detected from the DNA of the um, of the of the community that was collected by this 3G ESP. So um, we also did some comparison between um, the the ESP and a traditional bottle sampling, and and they lined up really well. So this is a, a another way we can do um, you know spatial sampling. Um, potentially much cheaper and, and quicker than we could do with, with uh, ship operations. And so one other uh, technical thing I wanted to talk about before I get into uh, the Gulf of Mexico project and, and the ocean acidification um, funded work is, um, is bioinformatics workflows. So one of the um, workflows we developed is called tourmaline. Um, basically, um, a lot of the work with, with omics um, comes once you get the data back because um, you just get these huge files of DNA sequences. Um, in the case of um, metabarcoding data, you have lots of sequences from the same part of the genome, but um, they need to be um, quality filtered and they need to be, um, some of the noise in the data needs to be removed. They need to be clustered and, and then those sequences most importantly need to be assigned to a, a taxonomic uh, name. And how that's done is there are lots of different ways and, and some of the best practices have been figured out, but uh, putting that into a workflow that allows you to reliably and reproducibly um, perform that process um, quickly um, is still a, an active area of research. So we came up with this workflow um, where it's a simple software installation. Um, you just configure the settings and then uh, it's a command line uh, tool using a, a workflow manager called um, SnakeMake. Um, and then that will give you uh, some really nice visualization output files and, and, and different visualizations. 
Um, so in our lab, we're really kind of developing um, all different aspects. I don't have um, any slides here about the, um, the lab component, but we are doing a lot of method development of, of the labs. Um, I guess I do have a couple images coming up that you'll see. So, um, so getting to the, the, OA, um, the OAP project, um, this was um, part of the GOMEC-4 cruise that happened in the Gulf of Mexico in 2021. And so there were you know, 104 stations that were sampled in that cruise and we got eDNA from about half of those, so um, 54. And so those are shown, um, those are these pink circles here um, at these different lines of, of sampling. And so at each uh, station, we got samples from the surface, the deep chlorophyll maximum and near the bottom and triplicate samples for each of those. So uh, Sean Anderson is, is the one leading this project. So he went out to see, uh, he's been analyzing the data. So all the figures I'm gonna show you are, are from Sean. Um, and so this is, uh, was not a, uh, one of these newer sampling technologies. This is the traditional way that we get DNA um, from the ocean, which is using a CTD. So the CTD rosette is shown there and, and Sean is, is filling um, sterile bags with seawater and then um, filtering them using a um, fairly simple design. It's just a, it's a peristaltic pump um, and the water is getting pumped um, through, uh, it goes through the pump, um, the, the filter is loaded up here at the end and then the, the effluent goes into a, a graduated cylinder so we can measure the volume that's been filtered. But the, the key thing is these Sterivex filters, which are, um, uh, which are these little white things on the, on the lower right side. So back in the lab, um, we have the Stereovex filter. We use a um, um, QR code system to, um, to track the samples and makes it easy for us to track them when we do extractions. We use a um, automated um, DNA extraction robot called a Kingfisher. Um, this is a, um, the, the key innovation with this is it uses a magnetic system and then you, we use magnetic DNA binding beads. Um, so the beads will bind the DNA and they can also, they contain iron and they can bind to a magnet. So we have this um, very elegant way of, of um, isolating the DNA from everything else around it. So we can rinse away um, inhibitors and, and impurities and end up with a very pure DNA at the end to perform downstream applications like PCR. Um, and, and library prep for, for metabarcoding. So just to, to highlight some of the methods we used in this study, um, we're doing um, metabarcoding. So we're, we're, we're doing PCR and sequencing of a, a short part of the genome of, of bacteria and archaea in the case of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene and of protus and metazoa in the case of the 18S ribosomal RNA gene. So we're getting a wide um, breadth of, of biodiversity in these two assays. And then um, we, we use a method called um, DATA2, which is part of CHIME2 and tourmaline that I talked about to infer um, amplicon sequence variants. So we get um, unique sequences for each piece of DNA and, and those um, uh, those are more useful than, um, than the older technology, which was clustering into operational taxonomic units. Um, it's a, there's a lot of reasons why these are really useful, and they, they're pretty much the standard in our field now. Um, we assign those ASVs to a taxonomic database, um, either um, one called Silva for 16S or PR2 for 18S. Um, we, we can then assign those um, Function, those taxonomic groups to functional categories um, using um, some, some functional categories that were developed in the Tara Oceans program, as well as some of our own um, in-house um, assignments. So things like parasites, phototroph, heterotroph, these broad categories um, allow us to analyze the data and, and make sense of it. And then um, we use you know, R and Python and, and some open source um, statistical methods and visualization methods to make sense of the data. So um, 
in the uh, this is looking at the, that 18s data, um, and we removed the metazoa um, from this analysis, so things like um, cnidarians and so forth, um, and we're just looking at protists. And uh, what we did was we um, we clustered the data based on, or we clustered the samples based on their their profiles, um, but we also wanted um, to be able to look at the sort of oceanic layers in the Gulf. So um, cluster one is, is mostly surface and coastal samples. Cluster two is, is sort of below the surface in the upper epipelagic zone um, or upper 100 meters or so. And then cluster three is deep or mesopelagic, those, those deeper samples. Um, it's just a, a way to sort of get a snapshot of, of all the data. So what we're looking at here is all of the samples at, into those three clusters. And then these tree maps show um, the relative proportion of different groups. So in green, you can see different um, dinoflagellate species like um, dinophyceae or syndinialis, which is a, a parasite that's very abundant in the, in the ocean. Um, and you can see how these these groups uh, shift from you from the surface down to the deep, and different groups um, popping up. So this um, you can see like this polycystinia group becomes much more abundant, while the dinophyceae become less abundant, and this diplonemia is very rare in the in the surface, but becomes a big component of the deeper ocean. In the bacterial side, bacteria and archaea. Um, we have a lot of, uh, you know, same kind of thing. We were looking at surface and coastal, uh, near surface epipelagic and deep or mesopelagic. Um, we see the SAR11 alpha proteobacteria and, uh, are, are abundant, but that shifts to more gamma proteobacteria as you go deeper. Um, cyanobacteria, as you would expect, these are light harvesting uh, uh, bacteria, so these are more abundant in the surface or near the surface, Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus. And then um, uh, uh, nitrate uh, utilizing organisms like nit Nitrosphera um, or Nitrosopumilus uh, uh, um, are more abundant in the deeper water. So one of the, the main goals of this, um, there's a lot a lot of data here um, and a, a lot of really cool um, patterns. This is really the first large scale um, survey of, sorry, my lights fell out, but you can still hear me. Um, this is the first large scale survey of the Gulf of Mexico. So there's a, um, a lot of interest in, in, in this data and, and um, what, we can, what we can learn from it. Um, in general, the sort of Broad scale patterns are are, um, are what we see in, in other parts of the ocean, but there's some some unique Gulf specific patterns. Um, so there's a lot we can do with this data. Um, for now, I want to focus on a few um, things. So one is sort of what are the um, the the correlations of the main um, in this case we're going to look at protist groups um, and different environmental parameters. So um, for example, the Sindinialis group is really interesting to a lot of people because it's um, it's really abundant in the ocean and it, and there's not a lot known about it uh, its role. It, it appears to be a parasite of other um, dinoflagellates, but um, beyond that, it, it's it's unclear. And so, um, you know, we using a, a combination of partial least squares and, and general linear model, we can we can see that um, Sindinialis is is correlated with you know things like salinity, um, fluorescence, phosphate, and silicate, um, as well as carbonate and aragonite saturation. So, um, one of the great things about um, the GOMET cruise is is it there's a ton of of really excellent um, physical and chemical data, including um, ocean acidification data, and um, and. Both, of, both Sean and I are still learning about ocean acidification. We come from more of a microbiology background. But um, one of the goals of this project was to determine if we can um, develop uh, genetic or genomic um, indicators uh, of ocean acidification, um, you know, both to see what are the direct effects of, of OA on communities, but also 
um, whether direct or indirect, it, if we can use this technology at, um, as an indicator, because it, it, it really, you would expect there um, to be a good amount of sensitivity of the genomic profile of the, of the ecological community to um, any changes in, in, in the um, physical or chemical environment. So um, there's a lot of, uh, of data here. Um, you can, we can look at you know, different groups and, and their functions and, and how they respond or are influenced by different um, environmental parameters. Um, and um, I believe this is a typo, this H dot is actually H um, plus, so hydrogen ion concentration and um, a few other parameters here. Um, so one of the things we looked at, um, and we're, we're, we're still in the process of doing different versions of this, um, this is total alkalinity. Um, we we want to look as we're learning more about the OA. We're we're discovering that you know there's other factors that we want to zoom in on. Um, so we're looking at hydrogen ion concentration specifically, as well as um, um, DIC and, and carbonate um, concentration. So this is uh, total alkalinity, and so we can see some some interesting patterns like um, Karenia brevis, which is the red tide, um, tends to be correlated with a high total alkalinity um, level and, and, and so forth. So there's some, some interesting um, patterns that, that jump out of this. And so, um, so finally, what, what Sean did was um, he used a, a GLM model to, to zoom in on these um, Sindinialis parasites. And, and his goal was to determine um, if you could predict or, or first to model um, how this particular group changes in response to environmental parameters. So, you know, everything from temperature to total alkalinity, oxygen, uh, nitrate, nitrite, and ammonium. Um, and, and this was um, with, with GLM, he, you know, you, he needed to um, remove some of the variables to, to avoid too much um, collinearity between them. Um, but what he found was that um, by doing this method, you can predict, you know, an increase in, in parasites um, with temperature, total alkalinity, nitrate, and ammonium, and a decrease um, in oxygen and nitrate. And that a 1% increase in temperature yields a 6% increase in parasite counts. Um, so this kind of approach allows us to predict, you know, how a group like these parasites would uh, would change in a future ocean. Um, and so what we're doing now is trying to build out this model to incorporate um, all of the groups and also to extrapolate to, to future scenarios. So um, just a, one example of that is um, looking at temperature. So if we take um, temperature and extend it beyond the, the range of the data um, into you know, potential future scenarios of, of higher temperature uh, surface waters in the Gulf, we can see that, you know, it's expected that this trend would continue, that we would see higher relative abundance of, of Sindinialis parasites with increasing temperature. Um, so yeah, as I said, we want to continue to, to push this um, to build more um, complete models of the community. Um, there's also the, the bacterial component. Um, there's also uh, you know, a ton of other OA uh, data that we can look at, as well as um, satellite data. And I mean, the, the sky's the limit, really. So um, we're kind of still in our first, um, first manuscript, I would say, on, on this data set. Um, so that's all I had. I wanted to thank uh, all the collaborators listed here, as well as the, the funding um, agencies, in particular at NOAA. And um, I'm starting to lose my voice, so that's great because I'm I'm done. Um, and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Luke. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation, and your voice isn't quite done yet. So I'm going to throw it over <laughs> to do the uh, the question and answer session. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Luke. Um, this is a topic that's a little out of my wheelhouse, but it was super interesting. And luckily, um, Parker Gasset asked a question but then had to leave. And so I can, I can ask his question for him and look like I know a little bit about what I'm talking about, maybe. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure I totally understand the question either. But here it is. He asked, is it possible 
for eDNA methods to examine methylation and epigenetic cues for stress as a way to observe larval stress rather than just presence or absence. So I'm guessing he's asking, are there chemical signatures within the eDNA that you can use to see the condition of, uh, of a critter rather than just whether it's there or not? Yeah, um, great question. It is possible. Um, to do to look at epigenetic modification of DNA, um, it's it's tricky. So because um, you've got to have enough DNA of that one thing, um, and then the the methods used to to do. It, I mean, so the method needs to be sensitive enough to to be able to pick up that thing. So um, we've looked at this. It's been a few years since I thought about this, but we looked at um, applying that kind of approach to um, to aging of mm -hmm. fish because there's um, methylation, um, but then there's it's only you know um, it's got to be the right tissue. It's got to you got to be able to identify that organism and um, and then detect the methylation, and there's got to be enough of it in the in the water. Um, so. It might not be something you do with eDNA. It might be um, more appropriate for a lab-based experiment or uh, or a direct sample of a of an environment where you know that organism is really abundant. So it's it's possible, but we're not we're not doing that at the moment. Great. That's something I never would have even considered. So thanks for addressing that. Um, uh, in the chat, Dwight and Sam are having a little discussion about. Um, the relationship between salinity and total alkalinity. And uh, then Dwight, I don't know, or Sam, do either sure. of you wanna sort of bring it out to the group? Yeah, so you, uh, if I'm looking at your GML model and the parameters you used, um, you get total alkalinity as a as a predictive term. And I'm just, you know, we know there's such a tight correlation frequently uh, between alkalinity and salinity. I'm just wondering if, you know, if you ran the same model and you substituted out alkalinity for salinity, if you get the same predictive power. Right. Um, that's, yeah, we, that would be, yeah, we should, we should test that. Um, I know that, or I'm learn. I guess I'm learning that um, total alkalinity um, generally it, with acidification doesn't change. So that, so that we might want to look at other variables um, to, and I, I don't know if that's that's accurate statement, but um, might want to look at other variables too. And then, so we're yeah, so we're working on um, repeating this analysis for um, um, for things like hydrogen ion concentration and um, um, and carbonate. Yeah, well, for sure, salinity is something you should investigate since it's going to be a, an, an important parameter. And it may just explain the effect independent of alkalinity. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it may not. It just my first thought is that if you're seeing a correlation with alkalinity, that might just be an artifact of a salinity of the really responding to salinity. Mm -hmm. Well, Sam, Sam makes a good point, Dwight, about uh, alkalinity being complicated near the shore and in rivers, and especially um, in the GOMAC crews, since they go through the Mississippi plume. And the Mississippi has such a really unusual alkalinity signature relative to a lot of other rivers. I wonder if that would make that challenging too. Yeah, but again, you, I mean, I think you still should run the, the model sure. first with, with something, because I mean, even if that's true, and it is true. I mean, my I like first Dwight's idea of substituting it out. Normalization mm -hmm. is complicated. Right, Normalization is probably challenging unless, but I was thinking, you know, a lot of those and a lot of the, the the far field measurements of GOMEC were pretty far from shore, some of those, but but still, yeah, you're right. So don't normalize it, just substitute it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we get nervous like dropping variables and, and like you kind of have, sometimes you have to make this decision about um, what to include in your model. Um, would be nice if we could, I don't know, make like a, I don't, if you can do a, um, like a dimensionality reduction where you kind of combine 
things, but then you end up with these sort of Franken variables that you don't necessarily know what they mean in like a, a real sense. So there's all, I mean, there's so many things that are co-linear um, in these environments that it's sometimes hard to know what's really driving what. Um, that that is an area where you know if we if we look and our, our plan is to look at the whole um, whole genome. Um, so you can you can start to or even the transcriptome. So like which genes are present and which genes are being expressed. Um, if we have that kind of data, we get a better window into um, you know, sort of what 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 functions are responding to these different variables because you can often see that very clearly in, in that data. Yeah, and even and just a riff off of Sam's point. I mean, if there's a salinity drop due to riverine input, you might be seeing a population shift simply due because you're getting you know a riverine uh, signature coming in. Yeah, but that's going to be a reflection. That's going to be the salinity, and the alkalinity is just following along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we have, we do have that. Um, I mean, there, we do have that um, data in our, in our, um, in in a couple of our lines that are affected by the the river. So, um, one of the things we can do is like remove those points and see if it, you know, changes any of the the predictors. Luke, I think this is really interesting. I hadn't, I don't know very much about, you know, protists and bacteria and sort of their, um, you know, the, the governing physiology and sort of things like that, like in terms of what, why, you know what I mean? OA variables might um, right. impact their changes in communities. Are there um, like hypotheses there that you all are working from, like our ideas, or is that something that's like a huge gap, you know what I mean, in terms of, um, our understanding um, of things, you know, kind of moving yeah, forward. Yeah, it's a bit, there's not a lot of literature on, on that. Um, we tend to think of things like um, foraminifera or t uh, uh, pteropods or, you know, different things that are more sensitive, calcifying organisms that are more sensitive to, um, to OA. Um, and, and, you know, I don't have a clear, I mean, I don't have a clear idea about what I would expect with those kinds of organisms. Like, um, you know, potentially if, unless they're totally gone, you're going to still detect them. And so if it's a, if they're healthy versus unhealthy, would, would you detect more of their DNA or less if that's not obvious to me? So, so that's why we kind of, um, we, we cast a little bit of a broader, um, focus, which is that, um, just to, to, to see a, what signals um, we could detect and if there are certain groups. So at, sort of at a community level, um, if there are, are changes and um, sort of letting the data tell us what, you know, what kind of patterns arise from that. And then if we can use those patterns to, to predict um, how, you know, whether, we, whether we're seeing um, OA in a, in a given environment or um, you know, how we might expect the whole community to change in, in different scenarios. Um, so yeah, the, the sort of, um, mechanistic, um, aspect of it is still something that we're, um, we're working on, but I, I think, you know, there's a, there's a good chance for this work to help develop new hypotheses, um, for, for that. And, and potentially, you know, there will be, there'll need to be some, um, you know, lab-based, uh, experiments and stuff to sort of test those things. But, um, it's a, there's a lot of sort of um, discovery involved and, and then, you know, potentially some hypotheses that, that come from that. I know Kamiko has another question, but just quickly, is there a role for this and be able to monitor for like that functional changes, not just the relative, like not just presence, absence of, um, but, you know, I've, I've seen some omics work and I don't know if it was exactly what you presented here, but um, being able to use to sort of monitor the like sort of function, the, you know, change functional changes and shifts. Um, is that something that you view that this apparatus might be um, able to, to do kind of in the near future? Yeah. I mean, um, are you thinking about like rates of um, like primary production or like uh different uptake or, I mean, so, I mean, there's a lot we can do with omics, um, not necessarily um, 
rates um, per se, at least with these methods, you can do, you know, we can do cytometry, um, various other biological things that we do on some of our other cruises, um, looking at um, and that sort of thing. But um, with, with omics per se, you know, we can do more deeper sequencing of the full community. And that tells us something about um, different functional um, groups. So uh, functional, like genetic functions. So like um, different uptake of different um, nutrients or different metabolic um, pathways, um, especially in the, in the bacteria. Um, and so, you know, like, for example, there's a lot of um, oil degradation pathways of, you know, around in the, in the Gulf because there's so much hydrocarbon there. And so um, we can see those pathways in the, in those, um, what we call metagenomes, the, the full DNA. Um, so from that perspective, you, there's definitely a lot we can, we can learn about the functions. Um, at least the, the genetic potential to perform those functions. Um, and then we can do um, what we call transcriptomics to measure the, the RNA that's produced. And that's a little bit closer to like actual detecting a function, but um, without measuring, um, you know, using labeled substrates and things, it's hard, it's harder to measure rates. Um, but there's a lot of different tools we can, we can apply. But this, the deployment of the subsurface, like, you know, monitoring tool that you showed us today, is it able to go to that place yet or not quite? So it's able to do, um, Func functional genes. We can either do quantitative, you know, quantitative PCR, like I showed in the um, Lake Erie, or um, we can do whole whole genome sequencing. So we're, we're planning to do that for this data, for this um, set of DNA that we have. So the DNA has been extracted. We're going to, we have all this data now, but we're going to do additional sequencing to get all of the metagenomic data. And so this has been used, uh, this technology has been used in like the ghost ship um, project to identify which parts of the ocean are um, phosphate limited or or nitrogen limited or or co limited or iron limited right based on the relative abundance of different genetic pathways um, so it's it's an indirect uh, method but I think a very sensitive and powerful method for looking at something like nutrient limitation um, so ocean acidification especially in this area where we're, we're dealing with pretty subtle differences um, maybe a little harder to pin down that connection, um, but certainly with other things that, um, you know, other, you know, th there's not a lot known about nutrient limitation in the Gulf of Mexico. And that would be really, you know, useful to know as just kind of a basic ecological um, situation. So Luke, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to wrap things up too soon. I want to make sure we get it. I think Kamika had a question. Um, to throw in there before we we go, I have I have to scoot in a few minutes, but I wanted to make sure we got that last one in before we wrap things up. Um, it was great presentation. Um, Goship is thinking to sort of uh, introduce eDNA as a primary parameter to measure, but then you have tons of data. It's amazing the amount of data. Is a community plan to have an international archive of data management? sort of a plan? Yes, I would say um, we're working toward that. So yeah, so we do have um, genetic data um, and, and other omics data from GoShip that's been collected on the last few cruises. And um, so my group's a big part of that. And we, we just finished the um, A16 North and we're, we're going out on the next few. Um, so, and we're generating a lot of data. And so, yeah, we are, we are developing data management plans for, for that. Um, and, and trying to figure out where that data is going to go. Um, the, the omics program at NOAA has been very supportive of the data management um, sort of development, and um, as is the, the Northern Gulf Institute that I'm a part of. So we're hoping to get a database um, up on like a, a, a Mississippi State server that would be supported by the NOAA omics um, and, and ocean exploration um, programs. Um, and yes, we're definitely talking to like international groups as well. Like, um, so a big one is OBIS, the Ocean Biogeographic Information System. 
Um, so OBIS uses the Darwin Core format, and it's a, a very standardized format. So we're working on getting um, taxonomic observations into Darwin Core and, and OBIS, um, and also working with Europe. Uh, there's a project called Atlantico. We're working with them, um, and other. Um, there's Ocean Best Practices um, system. So there's a lot of there's a lot of efforts on this, and we're we're talking to all those groups and trying to make sure that the data gets um, shared as, in as many formats and places as people you know as people need. So it's definitely on our on our radar, um, but it's a big it's a big lift. But we're we're definitely making progress. All right. Well, thank you so much. For, for to Luke because you're here and also Grace. Uh, I think Grace happens to be watching this back. <laughs> uh, this webinar was recorded and will be available on our website. Uh, the URL is on the slide on screen. And our next coming webinar is next week, July 18th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. And it's on user needs and products. And then following that on Monday, July 31st from 1 to 2.30 Eastern time. And that will uh, touch again on new sensors, uh, new tech and methods. And the links to reg register for those webinars are also up on our website. Uh, thanks again to our presenters and thank you all for joining us today.